A grand tour like the Giro d'Italia is a massive assault on your body. Fail to fuel or eat properly and you will pay the price. So just what are pros doing these days to make sure they fuel up enough to last for three weeks of grueling racing? I caught up with World Tour nutritionist Tim Podlicker to find out. We caught up with Tim earlier in the year to discover that pros are eating way more carbs on the bike than we previously thought possible. A research fellow at Birmingham University, Tim Podlicker is an exercise physiologist and performance nutritionist with a PhD here at Birmingham. A keen cyclist, he also has a role helping Bora Hansgrohe as a nutritionist, so is incredibly well placed to enlighten us on the modern day eating habits of a pro. Tim, thanks for joining us. I'm going to start off with what is the main challenge for a Grand Tour ride and how does this differ to someone's everyday diet back at home? So there are two big challenges for the Grand Tour riders, in my opinion. The first one is getting enough carbohydrates in for really demanding stages. But at the same time, there are also stages where the energy demands are not so high. So we actually need to find a way how to maintain the energy balance so that the riders don't end up putting on weight. We obviously see the power um, numbers for each rider. We ask them to um, record their body weight in the morning so we get the physiological data. But there is also a lot of guesswork because you always fuel for the next day. Um, so you kind of um, need to predict what's gonna happen on the next stage and what the requirements are so that basically you fine tune the um, dietary intake the day before and in the morning of the stage. And let's talk through you know, meal times from the start of the day to the end. Um, where does it begin? Obviously breakfast. How important is that meal to start things off? Yeah, breakfast is super important. It's like um, the last meal uh, where you can still replenish glycogen stores. So after an overnight fast, um, liver glycogen stores would be uh, pretty depleted. Um, and yeah, you can still have some more carbohydrates for the muscle glycogen as well. So having different types of carbohydrates at breakfast um, it's really important, so some fructose sources like um, honey, um, jams or syrups is super important. And then, yeah, obviously like the, the breakfast that the riders are eating on Grand Tours are pretty big uh, because the start is only like around noon. Um, so there is plenty of time uh, for the digestion to occur. Um, and they, most of them actually, they don't really like having two meals. Um, before the start so they only have like one big breakfast and perhaps some other snacks and uh, it was always my understanding ever since i can remember that you'd have like three hours before your last meal and, and competing is that still the logic um not really it's really individual but yeah i would probably ha try to have the breakfast at least three hours before okay. sometimes it would be more like if it's the start is at like one o'clock and they would have the breakfast at eight obviously it would be more than uh, three hours. But yeah, as a general rule of thumb, you would always try to have like one gram per kilogram of body mass of carbohydrates for each hour before you have the breakfast. So like if you have breakfast three hours before, you would have around three grams per kilo. Two hours before, two grams per okay. kilo. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. So you can adjust it accordingly as you get yeah. close to the event. Didn't, that's something I never thought of before. And then, once you get to the race then, and you're switching to race mode, you've spoken to me before about how important it is to get those carbohydrates on board. Does that start from the beginning of the race? Like in the neutral zone, you get in the gels and the bars into you straight away? It really depends on the stage profile and the rider's tasks. Um, because if it's a sprint stage and you don't expect anyone to go into the breakaway, then it will probably be a relatively easy day in the saddle. Um, and you might only be like asking the guys to ingest like 60 to 80 grams per hour. So relatively moderate amount of carbohydrates. Whereas if the start, um, the, the race starts with the climb um, or like you have a rider that is going to go into a breakaway, um, then basically you start fueling, yeah, in the neutral zone. Already. From the gun, yeah. yeah, from the start, you're just getting that fuel into you. And yeah. is it little and often still, or is it just whenever you can, you're, you're knocking back a gel, you're getting a bar and... Yeah, it's kind of like whenever basically you can. Um, obviously, I try to kind of give them recommendations uh, to fuel really well, for instance, the descent. 
um, because this is a time when you're like not really pedaling, so the absorption of carbohydrates should be uninterrupted, and you can perhaps even like replenish some of the carbohydrate stores in the body. Um, whereas when you're going all out, it's really difficult to eat in the first place, and also like all the blood goes pretty much to the muscles. Um, so you can't really expect to uptake a lot of carbohydrates at that time. And how many carbs a rider is looking to take on then? Each hour in a Grand Tour, the Giro, for example. Yeah, for the hard stages, the aim is 120 grams per hour. Um, sometimes you ask them if they can, they can even go higher than this. So basically max out. Wow, so there's a lot of carbs. And do you think that has an effect once you get off the bike? So if you're managing to keep on track with that, should that stop you being hungry like later in the evening and, and you don't have to have quite a bigger meal after the race like talk us through what happens once the stage is finished so yeah even if you don't absorb all of the carbohydrates that you basically ingest um, um, during exercise and use on the bike um, what happens then is that basically these carbohydrates become available straight after the finishing the ride for the recovery so it will help you replenish the carbohydrate stores, so glycogen stores in the body at a faster rate. Um, and basically this helps with the recovery for the next day. Um, so you're not just eating for the stage, you're eating for the stages afterwards. Exactly. Within that race. Yeah. Okay. But obviously you're still getting in a, a meal after the race. What's that kind of looking like these days? It's not just getting the carbohydrates of any sort. Uh, we try to find a way of getting the carbohydrates that consist both of glucose-based carbohydrates and fructose-based carbohydrates as well. And this is uh, for two reasons. The first one is obviously we know that we can absorb more carbohydrates if we um, utilize both types of carbohydrate, carbohydrates, but also because we know that adding fructose um, helps with replenishing liver glycogen stores um, at a faster rate. When riders finish, you will always see the riders getting um, like a juice um, or like some cycling teams would use a Fanta or a Coke or something like this. And this is like a perfect combination of carbohydrates, um, pure sugar, one-to-one -one glucose to fructose. Um, in our team, we use a, like a, a, a juice that's a bit more healthy way. When they get to the, get to the bus, they get like a protein shake. Um, they might get like some more Haribos or dates just um, after crossing the finish line to really get the carbs as quickly as possible. And then after this, like the first phase of recovery is finished, like sh pure sugars, you then start thinking about, okay, proper food. Um, and they get like pasta, rice, um, and stuff like that, and then a proper uh, dinner um, in the evening. And is that individualized depending on the rider? Because you do have a quite a difference in size, different cyclists from myself to smaller climbers, for example. So does that change from rider to rider? So for the recovery, we kind of keep it constant because it's logistically simpler. Um, we might do some like individual modifications uh, for certain riders that kind of are really big or really small. Um, but otherwise, that would be kind of a general um, rule. And then in the evening, we would adapt individually the intake. Yeah. And going back to the amount, sheer amount of food that riders have to eat, are you as a nutritionist on the team free to kind of say what you think needs to be done? Or would you get any sort of pushback from, from the bosses or the management? Say the team's had a bad day and it's like, the guys are eating too much, the riders are eating too much. Do you ever encounter that? Yeah, it's, sometimes it's like a, a struggle to kind of um, make them understand that they need the energy and that, that the energy is basically, if you're eating so much food, needs to come from like simple carbohydrates. Um, and you can't really ask them to eat a lot of veggies um, and uh, fiber be before really hard days in the saddle because eating like this foods that kind of fill you up really uh, well um, will first disable you to eat enough of carbohydrates, enough of energy. And then the second problem you will encounter is perhaps having problems with the gut uh, the next day because of all this undigested fiber sitting in the gut um, and causing yeah, potentially um, issues um, requiring the rider to go to the toilet. Okay, so it sounds uh, like I know a certain rider that may have happened to. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, but speaking from personal experience, so I did the Vuelta Giro, and I found my biggest challenge was actually eating enough 
which is saying something, seeing as I'm known as someone who eats a ridiculous amount of food all the time. But when I was training, I was trying to kind of reduce my weight and get down to race weight because I was scared of the mountains. Um, so I was quite restrictive in a way with my diet. But then once I got to the actual race, I had to eat this vast quantity of food and I just couldn't quite process it. And I suffered with indigestion and, and bloating and then acid reflux quite badly too. So what, what would your approach be for me? And, and are you getting your riders to approach your grand tour from like a few months back in terms of their nutrition? Is there like a nutrition plan in the build-up? Yeah, we encourage them to eat a lot of carbohydrates on a daily basis anyway, to basically have the diet mainly consisting of carbohydrates so that they support the train, their training they're doing. Um, and obviously, um, in the build up to the Grand Tours, they also do some preparatory races where they already experience um, eating a um, large amount of carbohydrates. So, um, so far I never really had any issues with the riders complaining over like having too much food. Okay. And what about when the race actually finishes? Is there like a recovery period from eating all these carbs? Like how do you, how do you kind of get yourself off the carbs. <laughs> <laughs> then I close my eyes and just, yeah, yeah, let them do whatever they want. Really, there's no need to recover or like <laughs> go cold turkey. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's like, yeah, sometimes they would be like super tired and they would, yeah, obviously have a few days of like eating what they really like. Um, and one of the things they really struggle with um, is getting like really delicious food, um, relatively high in fat because they're not getting this in races. Um, so some riders would really like to have like a pizza or like something with like relatively high in fat content. Others would just like be lacking uh, normal food that they would get from home or some would just try to eat less because they have yeah, enough of eating that much. Yeah, um, that's kind of what I was like. I just looked forward to having a salad. I was really weird just making my own salad, sitting on the sofa with it. Um, but yeah, how... How does gut health have an impact on a Grand Tour? Is that something you've encountered with your research? Because that's an area I find seems to be growing in recent years. Is, is that something you look at when you prepare a rider for, for a Grand Tour? So, uh, yeah, I guess the import, it's really important. We definitely didn't really have issues with this. Um, for some riders, we do supplement them with probiotics. Um, there is some research indicating that it definitely it can help. Uh, both on the bike and off the bike, um, but just eating like very diet, I think that's really important um, for all the riders, both amateur and professionals. Uh, it's not that we are giving them powders all the time. It's not that we are giving them like yeah, some special products. They are basically eating uh, normal food, and we have professional chefs making delicious meals, um, and we like kind of try to source the food locally, um, get really high quality products to the riders so that basically they get all the micronutrients um, and everything they need to basically recover properly. When you're at the likes of the Giro, Tour de France, those stages are starting quite late in the day, so you have the luxury of having a big breakfast and then a bit of time to digest the food. Most of us, if we're taking on like a Grand Fonda or a big event, often quite early in the morning. So how do you deal with those early starts when you're looking to really get on board that big breakfast? You're getting up at like 3 a.m. just to get the fuel on board. The riders in the Grand Tours, they basically are still recovering in the morning. So for them, it's not just a getting about the energy in, but also other nutrients. So they would have um, carbohydrates and protein, for instance, and some healthy fats as well on certain days. Whereas for amateur riders that are doing like one day um, event, the morning is basically just about getting the energy in. And this energy then needs to come in the form of basically simple carbohydrates. Um, like I would prefer having rice over um, porridge oats, for instance, just so that like the fiber content is lower um, and also like the fat intake is really low. And by eating like very simple food uh, means that the digestion and absorption will take place really uh, quickly. Um, so that once you start, basically, there will be no undigested food left in the, in the gut. Um, whereas, for instance, Grand Tour riders, sometimes on easy days or easier days, you actually want them to eat less. So you basically give them the food that will fill them up before the start, unless and otherwise they might overeat. 
Um, so there is like a pretty big difference between professionals and amateurs in that aspect. Okay, that's interesting. So basically fiber, when you have like a real tough day out, you're looking to get on board as much energy as you can. You are just looking to avoid fiber and get those like, simple carbs in as much as you can. Yeah, like even in Grand Tours, we would pr probably like do before um, hard days, um, dinner without um, fiber or like with really low amounts of uh, vegetables and in the morning replace the porridge oats with like uh, milk rice uh, with okay. plenty of honey or syrups uh, to get the fructose in um, and this would kind of also add some variety to the diet of the, ri of the riders but also like have some functional benefits. So that's just basically like a porridge but it's rice instead yeah. cooked in milk. Yeah. Okay, and the syrup is something that's interesting, so it's getting, it's getting any opportunity to get in those sugars. Yeah, um, like syrups are like, could probably have some other um, nutrients that can actually benefit the recovery. I would personally go with like, I don't know, just table sugar or fructose, because for me or for an amateur rider, um, it only matters to get the energy in. So, glucose-based carbohydrates, which is rice, and then fructose-based carbohydrates, which would be like syrup or honey or, yeah, pure fructose or table sugar. Because I was always of the understanding that having those like fast sugars gave you the spike and then the big drop off in your blood sugar. So is that, when you're doing these sort of big events, that's not a, as much of an issue? Well, um, for those people that this occurs, um, and some are more prone to it than others, they probably know about it, so they can avoid it by eating, by leaving more space between the meal and the uh, start of the ride. Um, and the other way to avoid it is to have a gel uh, in the last like five to ten minutes before the start, okay. um, so that basically once you start riding, those carbohydrates get released and you don't really get this um, drop in blood sugar. Uh, okay, I see. And what about hydration? Because that is obviously a huge role in, in your grand tour. You don't want to get dehydrated. You don't want to find yourself lacking on certain days. How do you keep on top of the riders' hydration? If the day is going to be hot, then this means that perhaps you want to give them drinks uh, that are uh, plentiful in electrolytes before the start of the ride. Um, so kind of pre-hydration strategy um, because electrolytes retain some more uh, water in the body. So perhaps they might have like, I don't know, a few hundred grams more weight at the start, but this water will then be released um, and be able to yeah, uh, cool you down um, and you'd be used for sweating. And then during the race itself, like encourage them to drink as much as possible. Usually they're pretty good in doing that. Um, so they would just drink when thirsty and just encourage them to drink quite a lot in the first few hours after the stage. Because if you drink too much in the evening, then you might need to pee uh, during the night too often and that might disturb the sleep. And you probably want a clear hearing color by the um, evening, um, so that when, before you go to sleep, it's pretty much, yeah, like color of water. Um, if it's, you're dehydrated, then uh, it would be, yeah, very yellow. Okay. One thing I wanted to pick your brains about that's proved quite controversial in recent years is ketones. And is that something that is still kind of thought of as needing to be part of a rise diet at a Grand Tour? There is very mixed research. So for during exercise, um, there is evidence that it can actually impair high intensity performance. Um, so we definitely don't want to yeah, impair performance by giving ketones. There is no evidence that you spare like glycogen stores um, either. So I don't think there is a place for ketones on the bike. Um, whereas for the recovery, um, there is research showing that it can perhaps help with recovery. But if you look closely into the details of that study, um, it actually shows that people using ketones were also eating more carbohydrates. And yeah, I think these days there are some other things that riders are obsessed about and this um, yeah, um, idea about ketones improving performance is a bit like passé. Okay, so it sounds like a bit of a storm in a teacup. Yeah. One other thing I was going to ask you about though um, was bicarb. And I've heard a lot about this being used in recent years. When I started there was a bit of a kind of People used to laugh about it because it, it get, had a few unfortunate side effects, mainly going to the toilet. Bicarb, though, has had a bit of a resurgence. Is that something that you're looking at and using in, with riders at the moment? 
Yeah, it, I think like in a few years ago it was ketones and now it's bicarbonate uh, that everyone is talking about. Um, and yeah, I believe there is a space for bicarbonate um, okay. in the athlete's diet, um, especially for like perhaps um, time trials. It's been used like for ages now, um, especially for shorter time trials. But recently some people suggested that uh, bicarbonate can also be used in like one day races or some hard stages. Um, and we kind of found a way how to prevent GI issues. Um, so prevent going to the toilet yeah. by having like a dose um, spread over multiple hours, not just have one big bolus, um, have using pills instead of the powder um, and stuff like this that kind of prevents the problems. Um, the downside of bicarbonate basically is that um, some riders might experience water retention so that the next day they would be like almost two kilos heavier, which is a lot of water and something people don't really like to see uh, when they step on the scales. Um, and in terms of performance benefits, I don't know, like everything counts, I guess. It's like a marginal gain. Um, so some riders really like it, some don't like it. So it's very individual. But yeah, it's something that most teams probably um, give an option um, to the riders. So yeah, bicarbonate works as a buffer. So this means that when the pH of the blood uh, drops, um, it helps to prevent this acidification. Um, okay. So we know that acid like um, build up kind of can contribute to fatigue. Um, and this happens when you go um, below, above the FTP or the second threshold, let's say. Um, and bicarbonate can actually help with the efforts when you go above the FTP. Uh, so for like bursts of effort that are like up to probably, I don't know, 10, 12 minutes long, um, bicarbonate can actually help and improve performance. Uh, my preferred way is to just get the pills um, that perhaps are enteric coated, meaning that they don't get um, um, broken down by the acid in the stomach. So they only like release the bicarbonate uh, once in the intestines, but just normal pills would also be, do the same trick. So it's just sodium bicarbonate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be just what you buy in the, the stores. Um, the important bit is that you ingest it in like um, boluses of like five grams. Um, you start, I don't know, three hours before the start and then build up um, have like three times five grams so that you get around 15 grams. You're looking for ideally for 0.2 to 0.3 grams per kilogram of body mass. Okay. So somewhere between 18 and probably 20 grams of um, bicarbonate. Um, you need around, I don't know, 60 minutes for the bicarbonate to be absorbed. So the last portion you take is 60 minutes before the start um, of the time trial, let's say. And this is kind of the basic strategy. Um, there is one manufacturer now that promotes like um, having bicarbonate already the day before. Um, we don't really know if that works or not. Um, but yeah, so there are multiple ways of how to get the bicarbonate. And you're just looking at the time trials or is this also maybe a queen stage in the mountains too? Yeah, so for the summer, I probably wouldn't use bicarbonate because of the, all this sodium makes you thirsty. So you crave a lot for a lot of water and that's not ideal. Um, many teams are using um, bicarbonate in the classics um, because they have really short climbs um, and that's where bicarbonate is really effective. So they would probably have um, bicarbonate, some of it before the start and then some of it even during, okay. um, so like, I don't know, around five grams per hour or something yeah. like this. Um, we tried it, tried it, and yeah, it doesn't really cause any GI issues. Uh, whether it's effective, there is some evidence that can be effective. So yeah, um, I think it's, if the rider likes it, then he definitely can get it. Okay, interesting stuff. What sort of advice would you give to the everyday rider, like myself, maybe someone watching at home, um, how is what the pros are doing in the Grand Tour? Can they take anything from that to improve their riding and their nutrition? Or is taking on a Grand Tour just a totally different beast? So it's definitely not about supplements. It's about normal food. So the professional riders are eating normal food just as we can. So they, 
we need to encourage people to eat normal food. And one of the things we also need to say is that people shouldn't be afraid of eating carbohydrates because carbohydrates on their own don't make people fat, for instance. Um, they are a requirement that you need for basically producing the watts and um, yeah, recovering well. So I think these are the key messages that we can yeah, um, also be using in everyday life. So up your carbohydrate intake, get the energy on board and then go out and smash it on the bike. Yeah. Sounds simple. Why don't we ever do it in the first place? <laughs> but Tim, thanks so much for enlightening us on what the diet at Grand Tour looks like. It sounds like riders these days just have every single avenue thought of. Um, and I do miss the days when I had a, a chef as well. That's a, that's a definite, <laughs> definite bonus. But yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Tim. And let us know in the comment section below if you'd like to eat like a pro at a Grand Tour or maybe that's just a bit too much food. As always, though, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next video.